The two major unmet needs in head and neck oncology are the big ones, efficacy and tolerability. Um, extreme was an advance in palliative oncology, improving survival from 7.4 to 10.1 months. 10.1 months still isn't that good. Similarly, in chemo radiotherapy, we don't cure nearly enough patients, and our treatments, particularly cisplatin, are excessively toxic. We've realized for uh, a long time, for decades, that uh, head and neck cancers profoundly influence the immune system uh, in, in several ways. From TCGA data, we now see that there's a substantial group of head and neck cancers, probably about a quarter of head and neck cancers, that um, essentially are not detected or have, um, have ways to become undetectable to the immune system by downregulating HLA or the, the signaling network that uh, uh, allows a cell, the, uh, the immune system, to detect a cell. Uh, in other words, it's a cloaking device, if you will, if, if, you, if you like Star Trek. It's a cloaking device to the immune system so the immune system doesn't even recognize the cancer. That's a substantial number of head and neck cancers. In others, we realized that they, the cancer can upregulate naturally occurring breaks in the immune system. Uh, some of these breaks uh, are PD-1, PD-L1, CTLA-4, uh, and, and many other uh, checkpoints that are naturally occurring genes and, and proteins uh, really to regulate the immune response, mostly to pathogens, but of course cancers have utilized that to uh, avoid um, first immune detection and then, and then of course immune destruction. And those processes are are, act, are active in squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck. Another way is recruiting uh, immunosuppressive cell types into the tumor microenvironment. Cells like T regulatory cells, M2 macrophages, or other myeloid derived uh, suppressor cells. And we know that uh, head and neck cancer is among the highest expressing. Uh, of, of any cancer for these types of cells, especially the M2 macrophage and the T regulatory cells. Uh, and again, much of this derives from TCGA data, but other data sets. So with all that in mind, we begin to realize that both for HPV negative and for HPV positive cancers, there's a profound suppression of the immune system. We've known that for a long time. The problem is that we haven't been able to take advantage of it until recently. And uh, recent data would suggest, in fact, that um, PD-1 or PD-L1 targeting drugs can be quite effective as single agents in squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck. And uh, we'll, we'll see in the very near term phase three data that appears to show an improvement in overall survival with these drugs compared to standard of care. Often, uh, we're asked about new treatment approaches for head and neck cancer, given that we've had the traditional three modalities uh, for decades. Uh, fortunately, uh, our biological data and scientific understanding of this disease has improved. For the past uh, 10 or 20 years, we've studied not only the genomic alterations in the tumor, but also this concept that uh, the host, the patient, is uh, has an immune system that uh, at some point in the disease was able to recognize the tumor cell as abnormal uh, and was ultimately unsuccessful at, at preventing it, uh, but still plays a role perhaps in keeping it at, at bay. As we've identified some of the uh, mechanisms that tumors use to evade the, the immune system, that has led to the identification of uh, the expression of uh, PD-1 program death one on infiltrating lymphocytes in cancers, and its ligand, PDL1, expressed by the tumor cell or by immune inflammatory cells. Um, this PD1 pathway is part of a, a larger family of receptors called checkpoint immune receptors, and these can be targeted now in the clinic. Fortunately, there are uh, agents that were previously effect, uh, effective in melanoma, uh, and more recently in non-small cell lung cancer. And so they've begun to be tested in head and neck cancer. Uh, and in fact, uh, we talked about the potential for immunotherapy. We're now able to remove that word potential and change it for, the, uh, for positive data that have now arisen from targeting the PD-1 pathway with a positive overall survival benefit. 
data are not yet public, but there has been a press release uh, uh, from the company that uh, makes nivolumab based on uh, a randomized phase three study suggesting uh, an overall survival benefit, and that study was stopped early. Uh, this was uh, uh, similar to data that we've had for the past two ASCOs for a different antibody, pembrolizumab, uh, that targets uh, the same PD-1 receptor and disrupts the PD-1, PD-L1 interaction. And we had uh, phase one data from two different cohorts using pembrolizumab, suggesting quite a promising response rate. Uh, we still await those data which have been presented uh, to be published, but that should be soon. And so we have at least two agents that can target the PD-1 pathway. Uh, others may be uh, coming down uh, with data from trials soon. And so this is a very promising target, uh, not only to treat as a single agent, but to see how it can be integrated and trials are underway now to combine it either in the post-operative setting or in addition to radiation or chemotherapy or both and integrating these uh, immune checkpoint receptor targeted therapies into standard head and neck uh, cancer care. I think that immunotherapy is the most promising new answer to these problems. The checkpoint inhibitors, PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors, and perhaps even the CTLA-4 inhibitors in combination, are extraordinarily promising. We've seen really promising results with multiple agents in the pretreated patient population. We've seen data with nivolumab, we've seen data with pembrolizumab, we've seen data with um, dravalumab, formerly Medi-4736. Um, and now all of those agents are being studied in the first line. They're being studied um, alone or sometimes in combination with CTLA-4 inhibitors as compared to the uh, extreme regimen. And I think this is incredibly promising for getting our palliative patients something that every patient wants. No patient cares about a four-month improvement in survival. I mean, they'll take it because it's better than not having it. What patients really want is some chance at being alive a few years down the road. And these agents with those tails to the curve that we're always talking about offer a legitimate chance of that. And their combinations with other agents may offer that chance to a greater proportion of patients. I think it's only a matter of time until these agents are moved into the curative intent um, population. In fact, we have a, a phase two opening at UNC any day now, combining pembrolizumab with definitive radiation therapy. And I think these agents are gonna be integrated in all sorts of ways into curative therapy, into neoadjuvant approaches, into adjuvant approaches. And I do think that in both the curative and the palliative context, they are going to lead us to greater efficacy, including some patients getting durable control, and they certainly do so uh, with much greater tolerability than the standard agent than we're used to. And I'm hoping that this is just the opening salvo in a much more impressive war where we get many more immunotherapeutics uh, with various mechanisms of actions and combinations that can really revolutionize our field. There are typical patterns of response and progression that we're used to seeing in oncology. Response looks like a shrinkage of cancer, usually followed by a valleying of that, a stable disease for a time. Progression looks like growth, and if you're foolish enough to keep going with something that's not working, it keeps growing. We're seeing different patterns with the immuno-oncologic drugs. Um, we're seeing patients with really deep, long responses, some with stable disease that lasts a very long time, and of course, there are patients for whom it just doesn't work. I want to pay particular attention to one unusual pattern that, uh, called pseudoprogression. This was first reported in the melanoma literature with ipilimumab, where patients achieved what looked like progressive disease, um, only later the cancer started shrinking dramatically. The dominant explanations for this are either that immunotherapy takes time to work, or my preferred explanation, that immune infiltration takes up space, and that can look like progression until good things happen later. In melanoma, this is a relatively common phenomenon, and so it's very important not to discontinue patients too early. In head and neck cancer, as with lung cancer data that we've seen already, pseudoprogression is a relatively rare event. It certainly happens um, in head and neck cancer, but the vast majority, perhaps 90, 95% of apparent progression is in fact real. In lung cancer, we've seen patients not be eligible for third line therapy, because they've received immunotherapy too far past progression 
Um, and as their cancer keeps growing, they get more and more sick and less and less able to get a third line therapy that might help them. In head and neck cancer, I'm even more afraid of this because anatomically progressive disease can be very harmful in the neck. And so I think the key lesson here is that if you have a patient on immunotherapy when these agents do become available, and we all know that's coming, if you have a patient who's feeling wonderful with apparent progression, they say, Doc, I feel way better than I started. And the cancer is nowhere near anything scary. It's not sitting on the carotid artery, pressing on it on a major airway in the lung. There's nothing wrong with continuing a few more cycles, re-imaging and giving them a shot, that that's just pseudoprogression. But for the progression that looks typical, the patient isn't feeling wonderful or the cancer is near something scary, there needs to be a low threshold to just keep practice similar to what was done with the cytotoxic agents and just switch to something else. Unambiguously, the most exciting thing coming to head and neck cancer in the near-term future are the checkpoint inhibitors. I predict that one or more of these agents will be FDA approved in the spring of 2016, and I think they're gonna make a big impact. We're, we have these much gentler agents that offer a real chance of durable cancer control. That's gonna make a very big deal. Down the road, we're seeing these agents being compared to chemotherapy in the first line. That's an additional attempt uh, to improve therapy, and we're gonna see them uh, integrated into all kinds of curative intent uh, approaches. This is a revolution in our world, uh, and hopefully it's only the beginning uh, of the study of other uh, immunologic uh, agents that might make a big difference as well. The approval of nivolumab is an exciting advance for our patients. If we look to the lung literature, in second-line lung cancer, nivolumab was compared to docetaxel with an improvement in survival, the chance of durable control, and a favorable toxicity profile. We're seeing rather similar results in head and neck cancer, uh, and this will be dramatic benefit to our patients.